Hi scholars, it's Miss Roberts here. Happy World Book Day. You are gonna now take part in the Mass Reader Challenge. That's why I'm surrounded by all these different emojis. I have got the teachers from AJK to read the beginning of their favorite story, but you're not going to be able to see who it is. They're gonna be disguised by their emojis. So you're gonna have to answer below who is which character, or should I say who is the masked reader? All right, good luck and enjoy the beginning of these stories. Good afternoon, scholars. Today, I'm going to read to you the opening of Matilda, which is one of my favorite ever storybooks. And it is written by Roald Dahl, so listen carefully. It's a funny thing about mothers and fathers. Even when their own child is the most disgusting little blister you could ever imagine, they still think that he or she is wonderful. Some parents go further. They become so blinded by adoration they manage to convince themselves their child has qualities of a genius. Well, there is nothing very wrong with all of this. It's the way of the world. It is only when parents begin telling us about the brilliance of their own revolting offspring that we start shouting things like, bring us a basin, we're going to be sick. School teachers suffer a great deal from having to listen to this sort of twaddle from proud parents, but they usually get their own back when the time comes to write the end of term reports. If I were a teacher, I would cook up some real scorchers for the children of doting parents. Your son, Maximilian, I would write, is a total washout. I hope you have a family business you can push him into when he leaves school, because he sure as heck won't get a job anywhere else. Or, if I were feeling lyrical that day, I might write something like this. It is a curious truth that grasshoppers have their hearing organs in the sides of their abdomen. Your daughter, Vanessa, judging by what she's learnt this term, has no hearing organs at all. I might even delve deeper into the natural history and say, the periodical Casada spends six years as a grub underground and no more than six days as a free creature of sunlight and air. Your son Wilfred has spent six years as a grub in this school and we're still waiting for him to emerge from the chrysalis. A particularly poisonous little girl might sting me into saying, Fiona the same has the same classical beauty as an iceberg, but unlike the iceberg, she has absolutely nothing below the surface. I think I might write, I might, sorry, enjoy writing end of term reports for the stinkers in my class. But enough of that, we have to get on. Morning, scholars. I'm going to read to you today SEO Trot by Roald Dahl. Mr Hoppy lived in a small flat high up in a tall concrete building. He lived alone. He had always been a lonely man and now that he was retired from work, he was more lonely than ever. There were two loves in Mr Hoppy's life. One was the flowers he grew on his balcony. They grew in pots and tubs and baskets and in summer the little balcony became a riot of colour. Mr Hoppy's second love was a secret he kept entirely to himself. The balcony immediately below Mr Hoppy's jutted out a good bit further from the building that is own. So Mr Hoppy always had a fine view of what was going on down there. The balcony belonged to an attractive, middle-aged lady called Mrs Silver. Mrs Silver was a widow who lived all alone. And although she didn't know it, it was she who was the other one of Mr Hoppy's loves. He had loved her from his balcony for many years, but he was a very shy man and he had never, ever been able to bring himself to ever give her the slightest hint of his love. Every morning, Mr Hoppy and Mrs Silver exchanged polite conversation, the one looking down from above, the other looking up, but that was as far as it ever went. The distance between their balconies um, might not have been more than a few yards, but to Mr Hoppy it seemed like a million miles. He longed to invite Mrs Silver up for a cup of tea and a biscuit, but every time he was about to form the words on his lips, his courage failed him. As I said, he was a very, very 
Shy Man. George came to a river. On a boat stood a goat who was bleating loudly. What's the matter? asked George. It's my sail, said the goat. It blew away in a storm. I wish I had a strong new sail for my boat. Cheer up, said George, and he took off his new white shirt. It kept coming untucked anyway, he said, as he tied it to the mast of the goat's boat. It made a magnificent sail. Thank you, said the goat. George strode on, singing to himself. My tie's a scarf for a cold giraffe. My shirt's on a boat as a sail for a goat. But look me up and down. I'm the smartest giant in town. George came to a tiny ruined house. Beside the house stood a white mouse with lots of baby mice. They were all squeaking. What's the matter? asked George. It's our house, squeaked the mother mouse. It burned down and now we have nowhere to live. I wish we had a nice new house. Good morning. The text that I'm going to read you today is the first part of The Dragon in the Library. Chapter one, The Hunt for Danny Fandango. Do you seriously want to spend the first day of the summer holidays with a bunch of dead people? Josh asked. He was a tall, skinny boy with brown skin, a broad nose and tight curls. If you were to pick one word to describe him, he'd be very disappointed in you because Josh believed having a wide vocabulary was important. They're buried, Kit said. It's not like zombies, it's just a cemetery. And it's so overgrown, it's basically a park. Kit was stocky, pale and red-haired. If you had to pick one word to describe her, it would probably be muddy. Okay, that was the first page of The Dragon in the Library. Planet Omar, Accidental Trouble Magnet. Chapter 1. There was a big puddle of spit on my little brother's forehead. It was mine, but phew, he was still sleeping. Let me tell you what happened. I had been in bed attempting to have a good night's sleep when suddenly I was being chased through the playground by a teacher who had grease and slime oozing out of his ears and slugs for fingernails. It was a dream, a bad dream, of course. When I woke up, I was extremely and very happy that I wasn't about to be a monster's dinner. I breathed slowly to get my heartbeat back to normal instead of like it was on a trampoline. I remembered that my mum told me to spit towards my shoulder three times if I have a nightmare. That's supposed to get rid of Shaitan, who's the ugly head who causes bad dreams. I really wanted to get rid of Shaitan. So I conjured up a bucket full of spit in my mouth and shot it out over my left shoulder. That'll teach him. I just hoped it would dry before morning so nobody would know I'd spat on my little brother by accident. Hello scholars, I will be reading you part of a book called Rooftoppers by Catherine Rundell. Chapter 1 On the morning of its first birthday, a baby was found floating in a cello case in the middle of the English Channel. It was the only living thing for miles. Just the baby and some dining room chairs and the tip of a ship disappearing into the ocean. There had been music in the dining hall and it was music so loud and so good that nobody had noticed the water flooding in over the carpet. The violins went on soaring for some time after the screaming had begun. Sometimes the shriek of a passenger would duet with a high sea. The baby was found wrapped for warmth in the musical score of a Beethoven symphony. It had drifted almost a mile from the ship and was the last to be rescued. The man who lifted it into the rescue boat was a fellow passenger and a scholar. It is a scholar's job to notice things. He noticed that it was a girl with hair the colour of lightning and the smile of a shy person. Hello, children. I'm a dinosaur and I'm going to read you a story today and my story is how do dinosaurs go to school? Are you ready? Here we go. 
How did Dinosaur go to school? Does he walk? Does he ride in a busy carpool? Does he drag his long tail? Is he late for the bus? Does he stomp all four feet? Does he make a big fuss? When he gets to the school, does he play, fight and punch? Does he make a big quick grab for a classmate's lunch? Does he race up the stairs right ahead of the bell? Does he interrupt the class with his own show and tell? Does a dinosaur yell? And when the classroom and when in the classroom plonk down on his chair, does a dinosaur fidget his tail in the air? Does he growl during lessons or roar out of turn? Does he make it too hard for the others to learn? Does he stir up the classroom by making a noise? Does he tease all the girls? Does he pick on the boys? No. No. A dinosaur carefully raises his hand. He helps out his classmates with projects they've planned. At break time, he plays with a number of friends and growls at the bullies until bullying ends. He tidies his desk, then he leaps out the door. Good work, good work, little dinosaur. Rawr! Hi scholars, I'm going to read an extract from the book called In My Heart, a book of feelings written by the author called Joe Whittock. My heart is full of feelings, big feelings and small feelings, loud feelings and quiet feelings, quick feelings and slow feelings. My heart is like a house, all of these feelings living inside. Sometimes my heart feels like a big yellow star, shiny and bright. I smile from ear to ear and twirl around so fast. I feel as if I could take off into the sky. This is when my heart is happy. Other times, my heart feels strong. I stand up tall as if I can touch the clouds. New people and places don't frighten me. I can do it. Watch me go. This is when my heart is brave. When I get really angry, my heart feels as if it's going to explode. Don't come near me. My heart is yelling hot and loud. This is when my heart is mad. Hi scholars, I'm going to read a part of the story, Room on the Broom. The witch had a cat and a very tall hat and a long ginger hair which she wore in a plait. How the cat purred and how the witch grinned as they sat on their broomstick and flew through the wind. But how the witch wailed and how the cat spat when the wind blew so wildly it blew off the hat. Down, cried the witch, and they flew to the ground. They searched for the hat, but no hat could be found. Then out of the bushes, on thundering paws, there bounded a dog with the hat in his jaws. He dropped it politely, then eagerly said, as the witch pulled the hat firmly down on her head. I am a dog, as keen as can be. Is there room on the broom for a dog like me? Yes, cried the witch. And the dog clambered on. The witch tapped the broomstick and whoosh! They were gone. Over the fields and the forest they flew. The dog wagged his tail and the stormy wind blew. The witch laughed aloud and held on to her hat, but away blew the bow from her long ginger plait. 
hope you enjoy it. <laughs>